Catherine. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? Great. It's a beautiful day in Los Angeles, so that makes it better. It looks lovely and sunny. It's obviously, as you can see, my, my unnatural light. We've had a beautiful day here in London. Oh, but it's good. It's a time now, and I have to say I'm missing LA. I was supposed to be in LA over Easter um, at the club and visiting friends. And so, yeah, it feels like a long time now since I've been there. I know. It's crazy. It feels like we've been in quarantine for a very long time, but it's nice that you guys had great weather and I'm so happy that we have really nice weather as well. It makes it a little bit more bearable. <laughs> yeah, it makes such a difference, doesn't it? It really does. It does. Even, if you, even if you're working, you can still see the sun shining in. <laughs> I, know. I know, it's much nicer. It's great. And you can just stand outside and get some sun on your face and it makes it, uh, changes your day, I think. Okay. So. Absolutely. Right, let's get started. So um, hi everyone and thank you for joining us. It's my absolute pleasure today to be talking with the wonderful Catherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. Um, Catherine has very recently released her latest book, The Gift of Forgiveness, an inspiring must read that has already become a New York Times bestseller. Huge congratulations. Thank you. Um, She's also written several other books, and this isn't the first time that she's been a New York Times bestselling author. As well as being an author, she's a huge animal rights advocate, uh, daughter, sister, wife, and stepmom. So lots and lots of hats that you wear. <laughs> um, so if you have questions, please do um, put them uh, in the comments box, and I'll try to get to them at the end. So Catherine, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. Um, Thank you. Of uh, course. A huge congratulations on your latest, um, your latest book. Oh, um, thank you. Fascinating subject matter. So we really want to um, have enough time to talk about that um, today. So to understand the journey to overcoming unforgivable and unimaginable experiences, you interviewed 20 people, I think, for the book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I um, so my book is uh, called The Gift of Forgiveness, and it came out the week that we all went into quarantine, which was very interesting. <laughs> um, and the as you mentioned, the <laughs> yeah, it's very different. As you yeah. mentioned, I've done a couple of books. This was my fourth book, so um, I've done a couple of different book tours in my past, but none that were quite like this. So it was a little bit of. Um, required some pivoting and it was actually a really amazing experience because I think that um, you know I was required to pivot in ways and connect with people in ways that I hadn't anticipated and it actually was an amazing experience because I heard a lot of people uh, saying to me that they don't think that they would have necessarily picked up a book on forgiveness uh, had they not been in quarantine and had the time to do that so I feel really lucky actually to have been able to have the book come out at a time when people uh, can make time for themselves and to do work on themselves that, you know, we kind of tend to put off in our fast paced life. So that was a great part of it. But the book is made up of uh, 22 different uh, people's stories that I interviewed. So it's not uh, just me talking in the book. It's 22 different people that I interviewed. And all of them are from all different walks of life, of life, all different age groups, all different backgrounds, some, you know, with religion, some without religion, um, and all different kinds of forgiveness experiences, because I felt that in my life, when I've been struggling with forgiveness, that being able to talk to other people about their forgiveness journeys and experiences and struggles and listen to their stories and hear their struggles is really what has helped me in my own journey. And also understanding that, uh, you know, what forgiveness means to one person is completely different than what it means to another person. And that's okay. And it's all about, you know, living life and getting a, for, a greater and better understanding of the role of forgiveness in each of our lives and that's unique so um so yeah it's been an, an amazing experience it took me two and a half years to write it and we're still um it was uh on the new york times bestseller list which i'm so happy and grateful and it really that shows me that forgiveness is a topic that people really feel like they want to be talking about and that they need guidance on and 
um, and want to read more information about. So that makes me very excited and happy. Was there a particular catalyst for you in your own life or your own journey or something that you felt you were not able to forgive that made you think about this as a topic for the book? Was there a personal experience that, that was a catalyst? Yeah, I really was struggling. I had a really big falling out with one of my best friends that I thought was kind of like a lifetime friendship. And I went through a really challenging time there where I just felt like my uh, ability to forgive was really tested because I felt like for years I could not forgive and I was really struggling with it. And so I kind of went to, you know, I would go to therapy and I would talk to other people and I would go to different churches and just try to find books and um, anything that was like a helpful resource for me and my forgiveness journey. And I ended up really getting a huge amount of help and guidance from just talking to different people about their forgiveness journey. And that's why I wanted to turn it into a book format that way, because I felt that, you know, uh, you can talk to 20 people and you can, you might see yourself or your story in one person's example and feel inspired to practice forgiveness or inspired to dive deeper into forgiveness in your own life. And so my hope with the book is that, you know, someone will read it and see themselves in that journey and also uh, feel less alone in their journey because I think forgiveness is something that, you know, we don't really talk that much about. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet we all experience it in our lives or come face to face with the opportunity to forgive. So it's, uh, it's not age specific or gender specific. It's, it's something that all of us will experience. And there's some incredible um, stories in the book and I don't want, I want everyone to go and buy it. So I don't, I don't want you to give it all away, but maybe you could give us a couple of examples of, that, that really st stuck with you and, and continue to stick with you of the stories. Yeah. So it's, uh, it consists of 22 people. So there are a wide variety of different experiences. And, and again, my goal with that is really um, to have, you know, some people in the book were able to practice forgiveness in an instant. Like there was, you know, one of the people in there is named Chris Williams and he was hit by a drunk driver and lost his pregnant wife and two children. And he talks about practicing forgiveness in the instant that, that he woke up in the car. And then you have people like Deborah Kopakin, uh, who experienced rape and talks about forgiving her rapist 30 years later. So, uh, and then you have some people who still struggle with forgiveness and um, it was really important to me to have a really good variety of different experiences with forgiveness, relationships with forgiveness, um, struggles with forgiveness, because I think that that speaks to just the topic in general and also how complicated it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I think my first interview was with Elizabeth Smart, which um, I think a lot of us might know her story, especially in America, which is she was abducted when she was very young and um, and held in captivity for nine months and raped every day and just treated terribly. And she talks about being returned to her family and uh, and practicing forgiveness in order to move on with her life. Um, there's uh, Devon Franklin who talked about forgiveness with his uh, parent who was an addict. Um, there is, uh, you know, Scarlett Lewis who lost her son in the Sandy Hook shooting mm -hmm. a couple, uh, several years ago. And then uh, Sue Klebold, who some people might recognize her son's name, Dylan Klebold, who was the Columbine shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, Pablo Escobar's son, Sebastian Marroquin, who talks about uh, his forgiveness journey with his father, but also just his mission in life to bring forgiveness to Colombia. So there are a lot of uh, really diverse and unique experiences in the book. And, um, and, and very uh, powerful, very, very powerful stories. Yes. Is everything forgivable? So you know, should we forgive those who don't offer any ounce of remorse? Well, I think this is a topic that actually, and a question that's come up a huge amount in my book tour and also just leading up to talking about um, the book tour and, uh, and the book in general. So uh, a huge amount of people ask about, you know, I can't forgive someone. What they've done is unforgivable. I feel like I can't forgive. And my response to that is always, I totally understand that and that's okay. Because I think that, you know, first of all, I would never tell anybody, I'm not an expert on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never tell anybody that they should or should not forgive someone. But I, you know, 
so when people say to me like this is an unforgivable act i say i totally understand that like i 100 percent get that um i think you'll see in these in these stories that there are a lot of situations where people might think that the people in this book had experienced unforgivable things and they were able to forgive and move on in their lives so you know hopefully there's inspiration in those stories um but then again there are of course i think unforgivable acts and that's totally up to every single person to make that decision and that choice on their own and also know that you know it's not a one and done situation for so many of us it's an ongoing process and also what I've, you know, I've continued to have conversations with different people and, and amazing leaders in certain communities about forgiveness since the book has come out. And I've really come to also understand that um, when it comes to people, you know, not being remorseful for their behavior or coming to you and saying, please forgive me, that a lot of us you know, want to understand that forgiveness is about you taking your power back and you taking control of your own life and um, wanting to cut chains from someone or a pain from your past in order to move forward in your life. And that doesn't always mean that you need to forgive the person, but it can mean that you want to take power, your power back and control of your life and choose to no longer allow a situation or a person to uh make you carry anger every single day or mm -hmm. resentment every single day and consume your life and 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 not allow you to have freedom that you really experience when you practice forgiveness so i think it's very unique to everyone's situation uh which is a great thing and also for people who want like a quick fix in forgiveness it's a very frustrating thing to hear but it's it's the reality of of forgiveness yeah, and for many people, I suppose it is cathartic in that way. I think it's really, really, really interesting that point around you feeling a sense of freedom and getting the power back because obviously anger can continually play in your, you know, in your gut and, and, and it's very, very hard for you to move on from that. Yeah, for sure. I think there are, you know, there are a lot of people in the book that talk about when they're able to practice forgiveness, it's like a weight lifted off their shoulders and they experience this immense amount of freedom because they don't have to wear this, you know, cloak every single day when they go out with, you know, anger and hatred and uh, sadness and pain. And also um, knowing that when you make the decision to practice forgiveness or to leave something in your past and not allow it to dictate your life moving forward, that you may, you might have trigger moments uh, you know, in your days to come and that's okay. And it's all about, you know, allowing yourself to feel those moments, feel that sadness, feel that frustration, and then come back to a place of forgiveness. And that's, I think, really, um, really encouraging for a lot of people to hear because for myself included, I hear like, oh, we have to forgive. And it's like a one and done situation where we never get angry again about a situation. And that's, you know, not really the case. And it's actually uh, allowing yourself to have feelings and freedom to have setbacks, have trigger moments, and still uh, know that your goal is forgiveness and freedom situation. Can we talk a little bit about self-forgiveness? Um, mm -hmm. You know, at Albright, we talk an awful lot about investing in yourself. And, you know, our community is made up of very smart-minded women who are very focused on smashing the glass ceiling and, you know, um, achieving their ambitions for their life. Um, but sometimes things are holding, they hold us back. You know, we tend to focus on our weaknesses and not our strengths. We dwell on past mistakes. Um, how do we all practice self-forgiveness and how do we kind of embrace our imperfections, do you think? Well, I, there are great examples and stories in the, um, in my book about that Iskra Lawrence, she talks a huge amount about self-forgiveness. Um, and a lot of people, you know, talk about forgiveness of another person, but also forgiveness of self, because that's a huge part of everyone's forgiveness journey. So it's also, you know, the most challenging part of mm -hmm. uh, people's forgiveness journey, because it, you know, requires inner work and not beating yourself up and being open and honest with yourself. And that's a lot of the time the most challenging thing to do for most of us. So I think um, when it comes to how to practice for self-forgiveness, it's, you know, unique again to everyone's situation, but I think just being open 
with yourself to welcoming forgiveness in your life and having that be a desire that you have to get to a place where you're forgiving yourself, not living in a cycle of beating yourself up and repeating this, uh, this cycle of, you know, self abuse, emotional abuse. And, um, and, you know, I was talking to this amazing rabbi recently who was talking about, you know, telling yourself a story all the time where you're the victim and mm -hmm. not allowing yourself to move forward in your life. And I think that that also, you know, helps with people when it comes to practicing self forgiveness is, you know, we all tell ourselves a certain story. And um, when we can press pause on that story or stop on that story and allow ourselves to create a new story for ourselves moving forward and not stay in a cycle of, you know, beating ourselves up, being hard on ourselves, uh, and not allowing ourselves to move forward in life. I think, you know, first of all, it's not helpful to ourselves and, uh, and anyone else, but also it's going to allow ourselves to be much more free and be the people we're meant to be when we're able to practice self-forgiveness. But I, I think when you read the stories in the book, when you, when people talk about self-forgiveness, that really um, teaches people and also allows people to understand that there are a variety of different ways to go about that. And obviously many people are facing a tough time right now. Um, lots of people having to make really hard decisions, you know, obviously the ultimate tragedy of losing loved ones, but people are closing businesses, they're laying off staff. Um, and I think a lot of people are feeling quite isolated and resentful maybe and, and sad. Can you do some of your stories and can you give us a bit of insight in, into how we can start to navigate those feelings? Well, I think that this is, um, you know, a really unique time for all of us because, you know, everyone is experiencing a situation like this for the very first time in everyone's life. So I was saying recently that, you know, normally with scary situations or new situations, you oftentimes want to ask your parents or people that are older than you to ask for guidance. And there is no guidance in a situation like this. So people are scared and anxious and frustrated. And um, there's a lot of unknown people are, you know, unemployed, losing jobs, they don't know where their next paycheck is going to come from. So this is a very scary time. And people are also at home alone and lonely feeling isolated. So I think this is a really, um, a really unique time and a really scary time for a lot of people. And I think that the most important thing to do is uh, to be aware of that and also to check in on people that are in your community and that you love and that you care about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a phone call, a simple phone call goes a very long way for people who are at home in isolation. But I think, you know, the more we can practice mindfulness in a time of quarantine and also understanding that, um, you know, that this is a really, really hard time, especially, you know, there are people who aren't able to stay home, who have to go into work and have to be in hospitals and take care of people and they're risking their lives and the safety of their families. And, you know, we're so grateful for all of them. And, you know, also knowing that when people are thinking like life is going to go back to normal after this, it's not going to go back to normal. It's going to be a new normal. So also <laughs> thinking about like what, you know, what things we can bring from life in quarantine into our new lives moving forward when we come out of this to make ourselves better people, better partners, better daughters, better friends to certain people and, and focus, of course, you know, on our health and being grateful for that and being grateful for being alive. And I think just really finding ways to support other people, especially those who have lost their jobs and don't know where, you know, where their next meal is coming from, uh, you know, finding ways to volunteer to help out. I think that's really important, especially if you're, you know, if you're able to. And um, I think just finding different and unique ways to support one another in this time is really important. And you talk a lot about there about the new normal and the fact that things aren't going to go back to how they were before. Uh, do you feel like we're moving towards a more compassionate sort of human world on the back of this? And, and do, you, do you see positives coming out of the pandemic that will continue? I think we are definitely, I, I would hope <laughs> that we're moving towards a more compassionate and empathetic and loving world after this, because I think that this has put 
for a lot of people, this has put a lot of things into perspective, you know, uh, having savings, having plans for certain situations, um, you know, helping people that are in need, having the ability to do that, uh, supporting local businesses, reaching out to people and saying, who needs help? How can I help? If you're, you know, someone who can do that. I think that this is, um, this is a time where also I'm talking to a lot of people about finding the silver lining in situations like this. And, you know, for people who are staying home with their families and, uh, and, you know, are, are not losing their jobs. Like, what does that look like? What are the things that, you know, people are focusing on? A lot of people are talking about focusing on, um, you know, that for the first time they're spending, you know, a lot more time with their families, with their uh, parents, with their siblings, with, um, you know, people that they're stuck in quarantine with, having family meals, cooking, baking, um, you know, being much more resourceful at home. And, uh, and I think that that, and also doing a lot of work on ourselves, mm -hmm. because I, I've heard from so many people, and I think, you know, forgiveness falls into a category of bettering yourself and self exploration. But this is a time when, you know, for a lot of people who are at home, and who are in quarantine and working from home that, you know, this is the first time for a lot of people that they're forced to stop and slow down. And so, you know, we're forced to, we're giving ourselves an opportunity here to focus on, you know, working on our insides, working on bettering ourselves as people. And I really hope, and I think that that will be able to be kept and maintained and brought into our world, whatever our world looks like moving forward out of this quarantine, because I think it would be a really, it would be a shame to not bring that, you know, silver lining part of this experience back into life after this. And, uh, and so I think people are working on repairing relationships in this time, uh, learning about finances, learning about home ownership, learning about uh, cooking, about family, just about, you know, homeschooling. Like there are so many things that people are learning about for the very first time that I think are going to be great tools to have in life moving forward. Well, it, it definitely makes you appreciate a lot of the people who help you as well. So, you know, I'm, I've been homeschooling. I've got two kids and it really makes me appreciate the teachers even more. Yeah. Know, just to mention one group. Now, you, you mentioned baking. I'm a bit of a baking. I've become a baking nut again during this time. No, I've I have seen real. you baking. I've seen you baking on Instagram. So I know we, we have that in common. But what else are you practicing for sort of self-care during this quarantine time? Um, I really, structure has been super important for me. I'm definitely somebody who does really well when I have a uh, structure and a schedule. And even this time of quarantine, I think it's important to try to create some of that. Also, you know, being lenient with the fact that it might all, not always go your way, but I still like to set an alarm for myself in the morning and, um, you know, wake up, be, do something active. There are a lot of online apps right now that you can do, you know, workout classes and things like that. And then I, you know, I've been this whole quarantine time just really doing a virtual book tour. So I've been yeah. <laughs> working every single day and, um, and, uh, you know, baking, as you're saying, organizing, doing things that I can do at home. Um, and also it's been super amazing for me uh, to learn about all of the local and small businesses here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and finding ways to support those businesses in this time because I think that we're so used to going to the same grocery store or the same you know place all the time and just to get creative with it and say like okay who who needs more support in this time how can we get our fruits and vegetables in a unique way and you know how can we um you know get certain produce things or certain uh needs that we normally would just order online like how can we get creative here and and really be made aware of small and local businesses that need support in this time so i think that's also a great thing that's come out of this quarantine is that people are made more aware of you know, of small businesses, small business owners, how tough that is, and, um, and finding better ways to support. Do you feel that a sense of community has um, 
become more established in LA because much as I absolutely adore LA it's very spread out you know so you're right. like driving an hour to visit a friend or you know, I know. Um, <laughs> does it feel like that community spirit has has evolved during this time I feel for sure people are definitely rallying together to support small businesses local businesses um I remember like in the beginning of this quarantine in Los Angeles, um, you know, farmers markets were in crisis, how people were going to be able to go to farmers markets in a safe way and also still support local farmers market people who would sell things on, you know, Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever the farmers markets are in your area. And I think people have really tried to get creative. And I know that I have with ways to support local people who are, you know, not able to sell their goods like they once were and um, an order from them go directly to people. And I know that, you know, with a lot of my friends and also just on social media, I see in general here in Los Angeles area, you know, people just constantly spreading awareness about small and local businesses that need support. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have never seen something like that before. And I think it's actually a really great and beautiful thing because it's, everyone's sort of helping out each other and no one has, you know, if, if someone says, where's a really great place to get fruits and vegetables right now, you can come up with 15 different places in Los Angeles of people to support and reach out to and post swipe up links to and just get creative. So I find that, you know, people are definitely much more uh, connected and supportive. And I also find that people are checking in on each other in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. um, I was saying that I have a lot of cousins on the East Coast and that, you know, being able to have the time to actually sit down and have FaceTime sessions with my cousins that I wouldn't normally check in with every week. Now I'm able to do that. And I think even in LA, just as a community, it's the same sort of a feeling of people really being able to do things that um, support and, and reach out to people and do things that they maybe normally would never have been able to do. Yeah, I think everyone's had to become a lot more creative. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning that your book tour, you know, you pivoted that quickly online. You know, we had to close the doors of the Albright and yeah. we thought, what are we going to do? And, and within a couple of days, we just thought we need to make sure we're still showcasing all these amazing inspirational women like you and bringing the community together, but doing it digitally. And in actual fact, you know, you learn something from doing that. And I think for us, it's been the ability to reach people far and wide um, that perhaps hadn't heard of Albright or, or didn't understand what our community was about. So there's always positives that come out of it. But I have to say, it's a bit of a, um, it's a roller coaster to get there. <laughs> yeah. And I also think like, you know, th there are a lot of times where I'll reach out to certain people and even myself, it's like, you know, we're going around, we're, we're trying to make the most of it and the best of certain situations. And some days you have off days and that's okay. Mm. And it's all about like who we can reach out to in those days of feeling alone or frustrated or, um, you know, uh, when is this going to end? There is no end date in sight. Like what, what's the time situation on this? Like, I think it's, it's important for everybody to know that this isn't smooth sailing for everyone. Everyone is in a situation of some days being frustrated, some days being angry, and some days being like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm okay today. And like, I have a list of things I have to do and, and it's gonna help me get through the day. So it's, you know, taking it day by day and just knowing that everyone's in the same boat has helped me a lot. Yeah, different kind of coping strategies. Um, right, there's a question here. Um, how do you forgive if the person who isn't sorry, or the person isn't sorry or doesn't know they've done anything wrong? How do you know if you've forgiven? I think that you know, again, it's unique to every single person, but I think you really know you ha you've forgiven them once you don't have anger, resentment, or anxiety when hearing their name or being in their presence or um, feeling like it consumes your day or your mind or your thoughts every single day. At least it was that way for me. I just, I think that uh, when you can free yourself from that and allow yourself to be present in your life and really experience things in a different way, separate from that person or situation. Because I think, is it nice to have people come and say to you, like, will you forgive me? I did something wrong. Yes. But for a lot of people, you'll be waiting a very long time before that happens. Yeah. So I think it's, again, knowing that uh, forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself and not to another person. And knowing that you can do that without the permission or request from another person that's involved. 
Do you think, um, certainly in Britain, we say sorry a lot, you know, for yeah. anything and everything. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that sort of undermines the, some of the, the, the notion of what forgiveness really is? Because we're constantly saying, oh, sorry, sorry. So my 10-year-old daughter's a good example. She's constantly saying sorry. And I keep saying to her, what, where are you, why are you doing that? It's almost like a, just a habit. Yeah, it's like a reflex. I think that, um, you know, I'm sorry, of course, still means something to a lot of us. But I think also I apologize and I was wrong are also great other ways to yeah. be able to um, hold yourself accountable and feel like you've really been able to acknowledge the hurt that you've caused or the pain that you've caused in a situation and know that uh, let someone know that it, you don't intend on it ever happening again and that you've learned from your mistakes. So I think there are different ways to articulate uh, I'm sorry that to get creative with it and know that um, you know we constantly are using oh sorry I'm sorry and uh, and how can you make that more meaningful when something you know really uh, terrible has happened well, that's great advice and really really good advice I'm, I'm gonna follow that myself um, <laughs> so um, what's next for you What's coming up? Well, I'm still doing um, this book tour. Um, we're going to have an amazing podcast come out soon uh, on forgiveness that I'm going to be doing, which I'm really excited about. So um, stay tuned for that. And then I hope to just do, you know, continue doing what I'm doing, more books, things I'm passionate about. But I worked on this book for two and a half years, so I definitely want to, you know, keep going with it <laughs> and keep connecting and spreading the word about forgiveness. Uh, have you have you got another book brewing? Do you do you start with a sort of kernel of an idea and then give yourself a long run up, or do you give yourself a complete break when you finish a big project? I, really, all of my all four of my books have come from just like life experiences and life moments, and so whenever that happens, I don't ever keep myself on a time uh, like a time structure or anything. Um, I you know, I have been really lucky to be able to do four books so far. And I love the process. And I mainly love being able to write about things that I'm really passionate about and to be able to spread awareness around them and conversation around them is what I'm most excited about and grateful for. Um, so I, I always like to be thinking of different ways to kind of like what the next thing will be, what will be my next uh, project what will be my next activity uh, that I will be kind of diving headfirst into with when it comes to the book world but I also like to keep in mind that um, the book came out I think five or six weeks ago now so I, I do want to be present in the celebration of that and the birth of that project uh, knowing that it has taken me two and a half years to do it and not just kind of skip right over it and go to the next thing which I think is a habit that is not a great one that so many of us are in is or have is like okay what what now what's next yeah. what's next and not really being present in the success or joy of our current uh current projects jobs or whatever the situation is so it's very true particularly amongst us strivers and planners it's yes. hard to go i did that and also when it's yeah. been two and a half years i mean my co-founder debbie and i wrote a book and we wrote it together and we did it really quickly actually we wrote it over the course of a year um well you know relatively quickly but there was two of us and honestly we were just like once it was done we were like oh okay move on yeah. it on kind of new year's eve i remember i was in the states at the time and um it was really hard to actually remember oh yeah actually it's only just been published now <laughs> yeah we do I know. It, takes, it takes such a long time to actually get it out there and then once it is out there you're like yeah, okay, so now I really want to focus on it. So it's, yeah, the book world is an interesting one. Yeah, very much so. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. It's a pleasure talking to you. Appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, for all of you who joined, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to check out um, Albright uh, Connect.com for a full list of all the events we've got coming up. Um, Tomorrow uh, is Friday and we've got the awesome elite coach, uh, Lynn Blades, who does a fantastic thing on a Friday, which is coaching over cocktails at 5 p.m. UK time. It'll be a bit earlier in L.A., but, you know, you could have a Bloody Mary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have a wonderful day. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.